So, my job today is to, uh, to get you started on the future. When I was listening to other speakers before me, I was thinking that it's really great to see that you have an initiative for the digital economy here in Malaysia. Uh, my job as a futurist is to think about what's coming in three to five years. So to work backwards from the future. And the way I like to do this is by saying, you know, there's a great Chinese saying that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. Because children know the future because they're not busy making money or making plans for the present. So that's something to think about when we talk about the future and uh, when we talk about the future of uh, what we could have here in Malaysia. I did quite a bit of research this week on Malaysia. I, I've been traveling, I was here 10 years ago, but I've been to Indonesia many times. And uh, I live in this tiny country over here, it's the size of one of your towers. I live in Switzerland, a population of 7 million, which I think is the entire population of the KL Valley. It's also 7 million. So I live in a fairly small country. I can share some of my experiences of what we do there as well. Uh, if you want to ask questions, you can, of course, feel free to ask in person. That's still a possibility. Otherwise, you can also Twitter Ask Gert. That's the hashtag. My name, Gert, like gastrointestinal reflux disease, the same. Um, so you can also, of course, use the hashtag of the organization. So first of all, about my job, this is what I do. I try to touch the trends that are happening in the next three to five years. In many ways, that means I'm going back to being a child, playing with the future. I also try to recognize pattern. There's a great science fiction novel by, uh, by William Gibson called Pattern Recognition. And if you're in the marketing business, you have to recognize patterns before somebody else. You have to actually see the future before it's here. And the best person to do that in the last couple of years, decades, really was obviously Steve Jobs, who made the future rather than wait for the future. And so this is really important. Some of my clients with the futures agency in my company include Google and YouTube and Samsung and many others. And uh, the motto of my company is, it wasn't raining before Noah built the ark. If you know a little bit about uh, uh, this part of the world, it's... Uh, that's kind of the preview of the future that we're looking at. So first of all, I want to share a message with you. There is no such thing as digital versus non-digital. There is no such thing as air versus oxygen. There's no, you don't have to pay for electricity when you go to the bathroom. Right? It's just there. The internet and digital technology is now becoming like air. And Facebook is a highway, right? Facebook is a way that we all travel on. It's, a, it's an infrastructure. If Facebook died, for example, today, we could still drive on the internet, but we would have to find another route. You know, it would be quite difficult. So marketing and digital marketing is not separate from other marketing. It's the same thing. And in five years, we won't be even saying anymore that we are on the internet. This is like saying today, you know, 10 years ago, that you use a fax machine. It's just normal. It becomes completely normal. And marketing, as usual, is dead. And there's a simple reason for that. The simple reason is that if we are all connected to each other in a decentralized network, and if we live in a digital society, we don't need people to tell us what the best cookies are or the best cars that we don't want to buy. Because that's interruption. What we need is value. And really, if we're looking at our world around us, here's the inauguration of the Pope. Uh, 2005 was a picture taken at the St. Peter's uh, uh, venue in, uh, in, uh, in Rome, of course, and people are making photographs, and now 2013, every single person at the inauguration of the Pope is holding up a mobile phone. And of course, the Pope himself is twittering. So how is he communicating with the world? You know, he's basically sharing his thoughts. I doubt that it's his own thoughts, you know, but who knows. And then in California, we have companies like this company called Nest. Nest is a company that puts your thermostat, you know, the regulation for your, for your climate control and your heating, puts it on the internet and connects all the devices in the house so you can monitor energy consumption and compare with your neighbors to save energy. It sounds crazy, but in California, seven million people are using this, and three million of them are sharing their information on Facebook with their neighbors. And if they do this, it turns out they can share 40% less 
of costs of how you use electricity coming from the sharing from the monitoring. For example, when you're on the way home, you can use your iPhone app to then turn on your air conditioning while you're driving, using the internet as a way of getting to your home. The connected society has mind-boggling implications for savings, for efficiency, for doing things differently. Now, here's one thing to remember is that technology, of course, Moore's Law, you may know if you're in technology, is exponential. When you, when you count exponentially, as Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamantes are showing us all the time, when you count exponentially, you, you don't count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you count 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. There's a big difference. Technology is moving exponentially. In other words, humans are linear. You know, we go step by step, and we're not going to get twice as smart in 18 months. You know, that's not possible for humans. But technology is exploding. I mean, think about this for a second. The, the inventions that we're seeing today, they sound like science fiction. I can be on top of Mount Everest. Last week I was there, it was quite hard. And make a video to record for your friends on YouTube in real time on top of Mount Everest. I can go in Japan, I can go to a bar for a date and I can see the, the, the uh, social network profile of the woman in front of me superimposed over my mobile phone to decide if we should talk or not. I mean, Tumblr last week, the social network was sold to Yahoo for one billion dollars for a network of websites. And we're talking about mind-boggling exponentiality that we're seeing here. So here's the interesting part. I think Malaysia, from my research and what I see, is at this point of takeoff. Malaysia is at the point of four, and the next number is not five, it's eight. So your speed is exponential. In 18 months, Moore's Law, the development of what happens here will be twice as far as it is today, and then four, and four times as far exponentially. When you count exponentially to 100, what do you get? Some math people here, right? You get a billion. And that's what we're going to. I mean, if you see the Internet of Things, augmented reality, 3D television, uh, social networks, I mean, it's mind-boggling to see the kind of growth that we're going to see here. And here in Malaysia right now, we're going to see, of course, Everyone connected on cheap mobile devices, smartphones, pretty much everyone at low cost. And I would, I would appeal to the government to make the internet tax-free, for example, as an example, as I have suggested in Brazil, to make the internet available to everyone to reduce taxes on it. But basically what we're seeing here is that this is a very interesting trend and to some of you also very scary. The internet and mobile phones are essentially our external brain. And it sounds funny when you think about it, right? When we go into a bar, and we used to talk about cars or whatever, we talk about as guys at the bar, now we talk about apps. Now we talk about, you know, if we have an argument about the capital of Kazakhstan, we can look it up on Wikipedia. If we want to translate a language, you know what? And within two years, we will have automatic language translation. I, you can talk in Malay and it comes out in German even Bavarian German. Mind-boggling. I and mean, this, is, this is reality, it's not science fiction. What will this do to the economy of Malaysia when language is no longer a barrier? Any language, any time, written, spoken, word, video, films, movies, television. Mobile devices are becoming our external brain. And you know what? Because of this external brain, if you're in the marketing business, if you haven't gotten to the mobile yet, you're missing the second brain. You're going to miss out what people do there. This is why mobile advertising around the world is very, it's very small still. I think in Malaysia it's less than 1%, if I'm not mistaken. It's going to go mobile, digital, social, and interactive in games is going to take up between 30 and 40% of the entire advertising budget, which is a trillion dollars a year. Advertising, marketing, and public relations. Because mobile is our second brain. In many ways, you can say you don't like this idea, right? because it's, it could be scary. Because if you lose your mobile, it's like losing your brain. Right? Somebody can use your brain instead of you. But there's huge habit shifts and budget shifts. And if you're sitting here today and you're saying, well, I'm not sure about mobile tomorrow or so, but it, this is like the railroad guys, you know, when the railroad came along in America, the horseshoe makers, the, the one that made the horseshoes, 
they weren't happy about the trains. They said, we don't need trains, we've got horses. And there's a famous saying about Henry Ford. Henry Ford says, if, if, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. But he made cars. We're going to go exponential and there isn't much you can do about it. We're going to see disruption at an extraordinary level. For example, here the mobile phone operators. If you have a smartphone with a data plan, are you going to use SMS? Well, only if somebody else doesn't have Viber or WhatsApp or whatever, right? But, you know, the over-the-top applications are winning. And we're talking about $340 million every single day that are made with SMS around the world. And the mobile operators are facing the end of SMS, which is anybody from the mobile business here? Right? Hey, this is something to worry about, okay? So, we're seeing all this stuff like shop, uh, showrooming where people are going to a shop and then Google on the internet to find the cheaper somewhere else. I'm sure you've seen that. We're seeing the end of television as a dominant medium that's combining with the internet, converging. We're seeing music and on the internet, health analysis on mobile devices, people monitoring their own health. And the doctors don't know what to do about this. We're seeing money shifting to smartphones, digital money. In five years, we're not going to have credit cards. In many cases, it will be digital money completely. And think about the shift that makes, you know, if you're in the banking business, the mobile phone guys and the network operators are taking your lunch. Just look to Africa to see the difference. The basic thing is about this. When you apply technology, when you're using the internet as it was designed, you're going to see the, sh the control shifting to the user. If you don't want the control to shift to the, con to the user, you shouldn't have the internet. You can't have both. You can't remain in control of all the pieces of activities, including politics, including the economy, including uh, banking, and at the same time use the power of the internet for the network. That's not the way it works. And when you have an innovation, you have failure. I went bankrupt with my internet company in 2001, like everybody else did in 2001. But in America, it's a sign of distinction that you went bankrupt. If you don't, if we never go bankrupt, people say, well, it's not, you know, it must be something wrong with him. In Germany, if you go bankrupt, you know what happens? You can just go into a grave and close the lid. So, when this happens, when you have innovation, you have to allow failure. And this is something that I think, I live in Switzerland, we don't allow failure. We'd rather not do anything than fail. And guess what? This is the, this is the quickest route to failure, is not to try anything. So this is definitely something that we see here. I mean, we're facing now mobile revolutions that are of unheard economic scale. This is like the printing press. First going from handheld devices, then going to projection onto our, our hands, and then Google Glass going right next to our brain, and very soon, sounds like science fiction, the internet on my iris. Wikipedia implants. Think about that. I would like to have one, you know, if anybody of you makes one, I'm willing to try it. But this is a key trend in Malaysia, you know, that, uh, uh, and everywhere around the world, really, is that the internet is moving to mobile networks. I mean, if you look at the numbers here for Asia, they have doubled in one year. Doubled in one year. So the future is, in five years, 80 to 90 percent of the population online at, on mobile devices, not on desktop computers. So if you're in marketing and you're not getting this, you're in deep trouble. Because your entire audience is moving to the mobile platform. You don't have a mobile website, you don't do mobile commerce, you're not going to be there. In 2012, my research has dug up this one article, very interesting, saying that uh, digital marketing isn't really working in Malaysia. You should be the judge of that. But this year I'm seeing these stats and I think Malaysia is close to reaching digital maturity in terms of e-commerce, in terms of new companies that are launching, and, and all the activities that you see here seem to be very promising. So there's a bit of a reset. That's the topic of my speech. And the reset involves risk. It involves ambiguity, you know, not knowing what's going to be next. It involves having to be fast. Speed over perfection is a very un-German thing to say, but 
it's important to be fast. It involves risk taking. If you're looking at this, you know, banks are now on Facebook begging you to like them. Interesting phenomena. Trust in Malaysia is a key factor. This research from Edelman shows that Malaysians are much more interested about who they can trust than the price of a product. I mean, this next slide shows you here that uh, basically 82% of Malaysians are looking for brands to do more than just sell something. I mean, this has nothing to do with digital, it just makes it even more pronounced digital. And of course, now there's a Malaysian man was sentenced to tweet uh, is his uh, excuses in a defamation case. And of course, Air Asia's use has been widely documented. So the bottom line is this. It's all about trust. Marketing and buying and commerce is about trust. I don't buy from people that I don't like. I don't buy from people that I don't trust. And I don't want to talk to you if you're not interesting. That's not you, but now on the internet this is becoming pronounced. And our job is, as, as marketers is to create that trust and to create a funnel. And it's not to control people as to what they should be buying. So now we have, in the next couple of years, we're looking at this huge interface of technology, you know, machines, software, and smart agenting technologies, and humans. This is a key topic for marketers, because guess what? As a marketer, you need data. If you don't have good data, metrics and reports and also tracking, then of course you don't know what's going on, you can't measure your efforts. So what's going to happen in the next five years in terms of the data? We're going to into a mind-boggling future of where we have this phenomenon called big data, and I'm sure you're familiar with that word. Everybody's talking about it these days. But basically, it's like this. We have humans, we create huge amount of data on mobile devices, rating, tracking, cookies, sharing, and so on. And that data is used with information interfaces that are completely new, feeding into smart, intelligent agents. Google's latest product, I'll show you later, called Google Now. And Google's one of my clients, but I'm not divulging anything you don't know. But Google Now allows you to bring up Google Now in your, on your mobile device, Android and iPhone, platform, I think, at this point, and it's anticipating what you're going to do, because Google now reads your emails, it looks at your calendar, it looks at everything that you do, and it says, you arrived in KL, there will be a thunderstorm at 4 o'clock, take an umbrella. And it tells me this at 10 in the morning. Now, this is true smart technology, because I haven't asked. They send it to me, it came to me. So we're going to see how this plays out with artificial intelligence, we're going to need mechanisms this is where the government has to come in. We need mechanisms of permission, of trust, and of recourse. If you mess with my data, I have to have recourse. The next thing is we need standards for all this, how this, all these things happen together. Who's allowed to do what? How are we going to have an open platform with interface without standards? It won't work. And of course, we need regulations and policies and ethics. A lot of these things can't really be turned into law, but their ethics nevertheless. So then we have to talk about how this all will come together. I think this is a very big topic. So here's Google Now. Google Now, I'll play you a short clip, takes all this personal data, your permissions, your timely knowledge, and turns it into a product. Great example of the future of marketing. Instead of having to sift through and organize all the information you need throughout your day, all that information is ready at the exact moment you actually need it. Introducing Google Now. Now with Android, one simple swipe gives you the information that is relevant to you, right now. As you leave your house, Google Now is smart enough to check current traffic conditions and has prepared an alternate route for your commute. I'm not going to go much further because you can try it out yourself. This shouldn't be Google commercial. But it shows you a very nice trend. And the trend is smart, interactive, anticipatory, dynamic, fluid, wanted, all of those things together. And that's the future that we're going to see for internet technology. This is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Most of the mountain is underwater. I think most of the opportunity is here in Malaysia. That's where the flag is. And it's still underwater. You've only touched 10% of the possibilities of these technologies that we can actually use. And it's going to, again, it's going to be exponential. So the question is to me, in order for any of this to work, this kind of technology, marketers need permission. 
And that is the name of the game. Permission and data. You don't have permission, you're dead. And the future is going to be five years from now that permission is the name of the game, permission and interest and what's called likeonomics. Because permission requires liking. If I don't like your product, I don't like your brand, I don't like your company, I don't like your people, I'm definitely not buying from you. And this wasn't true 10 years ago. We're still buying from Microsoft, even though we didn't like any of their people, because we didn't have a choice. Today, we've got all the choice in the world. What television to watch, what books to read, and it's all about liking companies. And it's not about using those liking mechanisms as a, as a mousetrap, you know. When I talk to marketers a lot and to brands, the first question I get, tell me how I can quickly use social media to make more money. This is entirely the wrong question. Because it's not about that, it's basically about this process of opening up what you do in a much larger story, how you can get to use data that the consumer gives you. And this is a love-hate relationship. As I'm sure you're aware of, some things about Google or Facebook we love, and other ones we hate. It's a constant back and forth with the data that's being used. But I can tell you one thing as a marketer, and this is going to be so true in the future, violating trust, you may as well kill yourself. You can make a mistake, and you can come back and say, you know what, we launched this product and it sucked, we're sorry. We can come back, you can make, a, it's okay to make a mistake, but you cannot violate trust on a regular basis. And this goes for governments, it goes for politicians, it goes for bankers, it goes for marketers. And that is really what digital has taken us, because digital technologies mean empowerment. Empowerment of the individual user and the network. And this is something I think that we have to accept that also a key requirement is standards. You know, when the railroads came to America uh, in the 17th century, I think it was, they had two formats, a wide track and a narrow track. And when you were going from east to the west, you could not change the train because in the middle of the country, you would all of a sudden switch to a narrow track. Not good. So the railway didn't take off until you decided that we have one kind of track. So for privacy, for social media, for advertising, for data, we need to develop a track, a standard. Okay? It should be an open standard, a public standard, not a closed standard, but a standard nevertheless. Some guideline that we need to safeguard the user and their interests. And also very important, we don't want to be like Minority Report of the Matrix to where we are remote controlled by brands. We have to have a way to opt out. The European Commission has said that it's very important that people have the right to remain private when they choose to. And this will be also important for marketing. Personally, I believe that most consumers are interested in hearing from good brands, brands that they like, offerings that they like, Starbucks fans on Facebook drink twice as much coffee. So I'm not worried about this. Let the couple of percent opt out if they want to. That's not going to be a big thing. Radical consumer empowerment. As marketers, we have to understand something, that we have to be better than others, not louder. There is a difference. Okay. It used to be that the loudest yeller wins. I mean, I used to be in the music business, and I can, I can tell you that many bands and artists that used to be superstars were not that good. But they had good marketing. Today, in the age of YouTube and Facebook and Twitter, if you're not the best, you're gone. Here's a great example for a company that has learned how to be best by delighting the customer, Amazon. I'm gonna race you, race you, race you, race you back home The sun's going down now And I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go Cause there's a dirt on my skirt and pebbles stuck in my toes Oh, which way should we go? So Jeff Bezos is a guy to watch when it's about customer delight. You should take Jeff Bezos' principle where he says that anything is less important than delighting a customer. So he built this app that allows me to go in a store and look at, look at the uh, product with a barcode or even otherwise and get a price comparison in the store. 
Now this would put the fear of God into a store, you can imagine. And what are stores doing? They're saying, you know what, you can use our network to go online, but when you see a price, you can come and match it, and if you buy three of those, and we'll give you something else, and they'll find a way to deal with this, to take it inside rather than to stop it. The worst thing you can do is to be like the music business. The music business said people are changing the way that they consume, people have more powers, and we don't like this, so we're going to try to shut them down and, and take them to court to force them to buy something else. And what do we have today with the music business? I'm sure you're aware, 75% of revenues decline in 10 years. You don't want to be with this kind of brand. So radical empowerment, and we'll, we'll see some serious disruptions that will reboot marketing. One is the mobile internet. And I would predict that most of mobile internet in the next five years will become close to free or feels like free which is just included in a bundle. The same goes, of course, for music. But distribution will, will change this model and, of course, the automation of knowledge work. For example, being able to look for stock financial data and so on. Smart technology agents will do this for us. And the Internet of Things, traffic lights connecting to the car, you know, energy supply at home being monitored by devices. Uh, you should check this out on the, on the web. There's quite a few things on this topic. So there is this thing called the Internet of Everything. And this is what we're seeing right now is that it's no longer just about people connecting, but also about appliances connecting, about houses connecting, cars, and so on. Now think about this for a second. It may not be so useful to have your toaster talk to the Internet. Yeah. But when you think about one step further, if I have asthma, and I have problems with asthma, and I've, if I use a device that's, you know, the, the inhaling device, if that connects to the internet, there's a, a product called Asthma Polis. And Asthma Polis allows those devices to connect to the internet, and everyone that has asthma can broadcast where they are and what places you should avoid because of the quality of the air, or it can alert the parents to having used it too much or too little, and so on and so on. So there's a huge amount of benefit in the connected world. Going back to marketing for a second, right? this is the elephant in the room here today, that we're looking at $1 trillion for advertising, marketing, and public relations, and we're facing this that we have to stop disrupting people. Give them meaningless information for stuff they shouldn't buy in the first place. And that's basically what most marketing has been before the internet. You yell loud enough, somebody will buy your product. So now we're looking at the end of disruption. What that means is we're switching from this idea of the mousetrap, you know, creating a place to capture people, to this idea of a magnet, being attractive. Look at the successful brands today that are doing this, like Amazon, eBay, but also Southwest Airlines and Harley Davidson and AirAsia and many others. They're using attraction, not force, trying to get inside of people's head. Now, this is the scary part, of course. When you're looking at the evolution of the internet, you know, going from the outside all the way to the inside. But guess what? You'll never buy anything unless it's inside of your head. Unless you're immersed and you really want this, you're never going to buy anything because there's no other reason. People don't buy cars because they go faster. They buy cars because somehow this brand got inside of your head. So that is the mission, I think, getting inside. And if you look at what's happening on Twitter today, Mind-boggling the changes that are coming. Three days ago, Twitter launched a way of getting hired. Right? Resumes on Twitter. So this company here in Ireland, they posted a, re a, a job opening on Twitter with a mechanism of a Twitter card, and then you can go and actually apply on Twitter, no resume sending, no CV, directly through Twitter, you can apply for this company called Demonware through Twitter, reinventing how hiring works. Now, this is really empowering, of course, to companies. No more ad hunters, no more HR, but also to users. And it makes transparency as a, as a winning proposition. Smart intelligent agents, like, uh, for example, this short clip here from Audi. Call Matt. Hey, babe. Hello. What do you want to do tonight, Italian or sushi? Very funny. Huh? Oh, come on. I know you have something special planned for my birthday. Your birthday! Yeah, well, as soon as I'm done with this meeting, I'm going to head back to my place. Maybe there. Okay, bye! <sighs> you got this. I got this. Okay. Call a petit bistro. 
Bonsoir, le pâté bistro. Hi, I would like a table for the for tonight. I'm so sorry, we are fully booked. Come on! Okay, what next? Local search, bakery. Online destinations. Yeah. Perfect. Voila. You get the idea here. It's a very American video. I apologize, but I, I, I couldn't change her voice or anything. But now you can see what technology is doing to us. Technology is no longer dumb. I mean, yet, let's face it, technology was pretty dumb until a few years ago. And search is pretty dumb, you know, because you have to go in and say, I'm looking for fungus nail cure or something, and, and you find this. But today, the next technology will anticipate what you're looking for. And this is where marketing comes in. We have to want to be found, otherwise nobody's going to care. The future of media, I mean, if you're looking at these graphs in the US, it's really quite simple what's happening. And this is why newspapers, magazines, radio stations, and, and others are in deep trouble, at least already in the US, because everybody's looking to decrease their budget because they don't do this, right? They don't get inside of people's head. They're mass media. And on the left, what people are looking to increase, mobile media, social media, marketing automation, social networking, blogs, and so on. This is American numbers, of course. And in Europe, we're a little bit behind this as well. But you can sort of see where things are going. The question here in Malaysia is, to me, is not if, but when will this happen? And I'll let you be the judge. I, I can't tell you. But I think, from what I see, again, it's an exponential thing that we're going to see here. Not if, but when. We have to face this fact, and I think this is a huge opportunity for a digital economy. All marketing becomes data-driven, digital and real-life convergence, real-time, social, mobile, local, fluid, and predictive. And I'm literally talking about all marketing. We'll stop talking about online, offline, digital, you know, meet space, uh, contradictions. It's the same thing. And most people know this in our real life. We don't distinguish between, you know, what we do online and what we do otherwise. So we have this transformation that's driven by digitization. You know, we're going from, this is also very much a challenge for brands, you know, for your clients, is to help them in this transition. They're going from a product to a service to an experience. So as an example, computers used to be about boxes. Then computers were about tablets and going into the cloud. And guess what it is now? It's about the cloud. Computers are about the cloud, cloud computing. The same goes for data, from the Botanica to Wikipedia to the implant going into a database, minority report. It's all becoming the experience. So a lot of brands have serious problems with this because they want to sell products. Publishers want to sell books, not data. So it's been said many times that in this world where we're moving into, data is the biggest resource. Data is bigger than oil. And thankfully, I, I have to re repeat myself with this, but it's worth repeating that, uh, in fact, business intelligence is based on this new factor that data is the new oil. Data is becoming more powerful than oil. And I, I think Malaysia does not have a lot of oil. If I'm not mistaken, you have some, right? or gas, I think. Right? But the future of the digital economy is not oil, it's, it's data. And anybody can participate in this. Anybody that knows how to handle and to mine and to refine and to dig up data, the rise of intelligent data-driven marketing. Now, this does not mean the human is taken out, the opposite. Because when you have intelligent marketing, you need humans to make it tangible, to make it human. I'll have a slide on that in a second. So we see in this shift the different spheres of volunteer data, of observed data, and this is the scary part, the data that can be inferred about you. And most of our future marketing will be about inferring data. That means finding a way of saying, if this person does this, and they have volunteered this data to predict who they are and what they want to do, to create a digital fortune cookie where you can say, okay, I think my target group is here. This is all data-based things. So the question I have for you is, as agencies and as people, how will you manage to be indispensable? Because here's the law of digital Darwinism. Okay? The law of digital Darwinism says, if you can be dispensed of, you will. If people can find a way around paying you for something or using you or talking to you, they will do this. 
because somebody else will supply a better way of doing it. So as an agency, being indispensable is crucial. And to me, this comes in, this has nothing to do with technology. This has to do with this, the fact that we can have data and knowledge and information, but what really, what our clients want from us is not a bunch of data. We use that data. Right? It's wisdom, right? generally speaking. Right? It's intelligence. And for the next foreseeable 50 years, robots and computers will not have this intelligence. I don't know what, what Ray Kurzweil says from the singularity. I'm convinced that for the foreseeable future, we have a pretty good space there to provide that intelligence itself. So I call this uh, as an opposite to algorithms, you know, which are based on technology, of course. I call this the humor rhythms. And I think we in the creative business, you know, marketing is a creative business, we have to focus on humor rhythms and making it human because our buyers and customers are humans and not robots. And we have to take this data and use it to make it smart, emotional, fluid, and organic. This is a great slide from IBM, and this is a really great way to look at this, where they're saying most companies have massive amounts of data at their disposal, but fail to use it in any good way, any meaningful way. This is something you can bring to your clients, I think, on a daily basis, because they certainly need it. So, a few more slides and then we'll have some questions. Most importantly, I think when consumers have infinite choice in all the options, you can go to a thousand restaurants, you can rate anyone, you can go to TripAdvisor and look at everything. All these things, then brands and their agencies become sense makers. That's really what we do. Marketing is sense making. Saying that, you know, if you're looking for a car, you should look at this direction because it makes sense. Not because the cheapest or the prices are low. Patagonia has a campaign that says, don't buy this jacket. That's the campaign for a jacket company. Why? It makes sense for them to be environmentally friendly. And the year they launched this campaign in America three years ago, they sold 18% more jackets. Because they appealed to people what makes sense. The same goes for Nike. The same goes for the red brand in Africa and for Pepsi Refresh. Making sense out of things. That's the mission, I think, for digital marketing. I also believe that the agency of the future will be asset light. In other words, our assets will not be huge offices and equipment and tons of people, but creativity and being able to tap into a global network, as this slide from Kleiner Perkins says, and being able to use people all over the world in different ways. So a bit of a summary. Digital is the new normal. And if it's not quite here yet, don't worry about it, because the speed is exponential. We are fully in a digitally networked society, and everything that comes with it, including the threats, the privacy, and, and the abuse of the internet, all these things, is like nuclear power. We have nuclear power, and we have to deal with it. We can't just stuff it back into a hole. It's there. Offline is a mental state. It's not a technology state. So what I don't want to receive, I'm offline, but I'm not, it's not a technical question. Data is the new oil. And this is a huge opportunity for Malaysia, because clearly you can be a player in the data economy, the digital economy, without having to have that in the ground. So the takeaway, and to do something about, hopefully, in the next couple of years. First, complete convergence. Convergence of online and offline, convergence of digital and real life marketing, as my slide has shown earlier. All of these things are coming together. Second, linear thinking, will kill you. You're thinking of your clients, of yourself as going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, that was 10 years ago. Now the next step is 4, 8, 16, 32. And the speed is not going to be less, it's going to be more. So our, our challenge is to stay human among the speed because we can't move in this fast way as humans, but to understand what happens here. Third, big and smart data. This is the weapon, of course, that is for marketers always been, of course. But now, because of the internet, we receive a giant boost in the arm from this technology that we can use to analyze and do things. Fourth, anticipation and prediction. Using data, we can actually devise models of what will work where and how in real time. We don't have to guess. 
We still have to be creative, but we don't have to guess. And the big differentiator for people and for agencies is not to be smarter or have more tech or have more money or have more LinkedIn connections, is to be human. Right? To create human rhythms, not just algorithms. The future of agencies, in my view, is you have to make yourself indispensable. How do you become indispensable? Well, you're a thought leader, you're a person that people can work with, you have human qualities, you know a lot, you have a large network, and all of the soft factors that used to not matter so much, and now they matter, that's the only thing that matters. I'll leave you with this quote from Alan Kay, famous futurist, founder of Intel. He says, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I wish for you guys to invent your future, maybe starting today, take a leap and invent your own future. Thanks for your time, and I look forward to discussion later and also to some questions now, if we still have time. Thank you very much. <laughs>